The Nereida process is uh, presented by the inventors in this article in Water Research. It describes how aerobic granular sludge can be used to remove carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus in a single step in a sequential batch reactor. According to the article, they can reduce the area required for this purpose by 80%. So it's a very compact and efficient process. It's also the first really full-scale granular sludge bed process for wastewater treatment. You know, granular sludge is very popular in UASB reactors for anaerobic waste and wastewater treatment, but um, aerobic granular sludge has uh, taken much longer to, to develop. But this is the first very nice solution for, for that. So let's go through the basic principles. <clears throat> this is the treatment plant where they're doing their study documented in this article. So the main treatment plant with some pilot reactors over here. And as you can see from the flow diagram, uh, the wastewater comes in, goes through the standard grit removal and screening, and then about 40% goes into this Nereda process, while the rest goes to the existing conventional wastewater treatment plant. Since it's a sequential batch, uh, there is the use of two parallel reactors. So when one is in fill or draw mode, then the other one is uh, in some stage of uh, treatment. There's also an inlet buffer, so you can dose into this at one point and this to another point. And then the treated effluent is, goes on, and while the sludge is taken out, in this case here, it's mixed with the other sludge and go through <clears throat> thickening and digestive treatment. And then eventually you end up with a very phosphorus rich sludge that can be used for fertilizer production. Right, now here where you can see some of the sequential batch routines. For instance, um, the dry weather cycle, fairly long cycles because the hydraulic load is low. So you have a fairly long period of fill up about one hour. Then you go through the stages of anaerobic, aerobic, anoxic here, and then you go through a settling stage at the end before you start over again. And since there are two reactors, we see that they are and should always be out of phase. So when this one is filling up, uh, this one is um, in operation. And then when this one is in uh, doing, running the biological steps, then this one is settling and and uh, fill. Well, actually, it says fill and draw, but of course, you draw off the excess water first, and then you fill, and then you start over again with the anaerobic, aerobic, anoxic zones or periods. We also see that during rain weather, when the hydraulic load is much higher, these sequences are shorter. So, for instance, the filling up will then go faster but um, okay and also the reaction stage especially is much shorter when the feed to the reactors is much more diluted but again we see that the two reactors are out of phase all right then we can look at uh, here we can see how the sludge developed from activated sludge to granular sludge over a period from July 2013 till the end of 2014. A sludge volume index is a way to measure how well your sludge settles, and the low value means um, fast settling. 
So initially, we have activated sludge with what we could call fairly standard normal settling. Okay, there are just two ways of measuring it, with uh, depending on how long you let it settle. But um, what happens is, as the sludge goes from the less dense activated sludge, it turns into granular sludge, and we see that the sludge volume index drops a lot, so it settles much faster. So this is a, it also shows how long it takes really to develop a good granular sludge, aerobic granular sludge culture, you know, we'd say a year approximately. So therefore, typically when we start granular sludge processes, we get granular sludge from other plants that are already in operation so that we don't have to start here, we start closer to where we want to be. Here, we see essentially the same thing, that since the granular sludge is denser, we can have much more sludge in the same reactor volume, same time period. And we see when it's filled with activated sludge, we have a biomass concentration of uh, about three kilograms per cubic meter, while at the end, when we have a well-functioning granular sludge, we have three times that. So that's the effect. And by then having three times more organisms, uh, it's much more efficient and the reactor can be more compact. It's a little bit of nutrient removal that you can also read more about in the article. Here we see the typical operational cycles during a 24-hour period from midnight till midnight, where, for instance, um, we have uh, the feeding going on, showing the, by the yellow line. And um, with some ammonia coming in, uh, increase in um, ammonia initially then in the reactor, uh, when when we fed it, um, <clears throat> also during this period here, it's uh, right during and after feeding, it's anaerobic, so phosphate is released due to the mechanisms of biological phosphorus removal. But once you start aerating, you let the oxygen come up, uh, then after some time, the microorganisms start capturing dissolved phosphate and turning it into polyphosphate. So by the end of the cycle, the phosphate in the liquid is very low. So the effluent concentration is uh, therefore also very low. We also see the nitrate going up initially when aeration is going on. So ammonia is transferred into nitrate. And then when aeration is turned off, oxygen level drops and uh, the nitrate is also dropping uh, due to denitrification. And then the cycle starts over again. We also notice that each cycle is somewhat different during the 24 hour period with much larger peaks during the day when there is uh, more concentrated, more sewer and more concentrated sewer because well, people are awake while during the night concentrations and uh, amounts are lower. So that's why we get these changes during the 24 hour cycle. So then let's just finally take a look at the granules as they develop from the activated sludge shown here. We see the organisms, we see tendencies of, I would say, granulation, more denser spots within the um, flocks. <clears throat> and then gradually we get very pronounced granular particles. And here, it's transformed into pretty much only granular. There's still some kind of diffuse biomass, but it's attached to the granules as sort of as a biofilm. So it's also retained in the reactor. It can be seen by other types of microscopy. 
uh, different types of staining and uh, perhaps the most interesting is this showing um, the organisms with the polyphosphate inside so as much as 50 percent of the microorganisms can be uh, polyphosphate when the bio P process is working real well. So here we have a cell with a large energy storage polyphosphate. We also see there's another example, a cell that is uh, getting ready to split into two cells and uh, interestingly it has two separate storage bins of polyphosphate. So when it eventually splits it's a complete cell with its own storage. We see many cells, this looks like it's just split. This is an early stage of preparing to split. So it's a nice and efficient way of treating wastewater. It's growing in popularity and due to its efficiency and compactness, it could be a very good choice when Wastewater treatment plants that need to upgrade to more nutrient removal and especially in cases where there is limited space for this since they don't need a set separate sedimentation tanks they can and the granular sludge is so efficient you can make a very compact process.